Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Old Testament reading is from Psalms 118, chapter, excuse me, verses 1 through 2, 19 through 29, pages, or page 143. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous to our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from this house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. From the Gospel of St. Luke, the 19th chapter, verses 28 through 40. And when he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount that is called Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village opposite where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their garments on the colt, they set Jesus upon it. And as he rode along, they spread their garments on the road, and as he was now drawing near the Mount of Olives, at the descent of that mount, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answers, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Here ends the reading of God's holy word from the gospel. For this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good to be back here with you again. I think it was last year I was here, the end of the year. <clears throat> In fact, I think it was the last time I preached. I really am enjoying retirement. <laughs> but it's fun every once in a while to dig through the old sermon files. I have 45 years of them. 
I, I don't why I don't just get rid of them, but I keep them for occasions, I guess, like this. You, uh, I understand, are going to have a new interim pastor in the beginning of May. I'm sure you're looking forward to that, uh, as I'm sure the people over at First Presbyterian Church in Bay City are also looking forward to their time of transition as well. Incidentally, I've never been to a church where the entire choir comes and plays the bells. I think that's absolutely magnificent. <laughs> I really do. I, I, I think it's wonderful. You're all trained musicians, obviously. <clears throat> well, let us attend to the sermon. The gospel writers often vary in the manner in which they uh, present the accounts of the various key events in Jesus' ministry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this scripture lesson that I read from Luke is but one account of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. There are accounts of Jesus' Palm Sunday entry in all four of the Gospels. That's unusual. In both Matthew and Mark's account of the entry in Jerusalem, those who witnessed the events seem to include more than the disciples who are the primary witnesses, as mentioned in this account that I read from Luke's Gospel. In Matthew's Gospel, we find that witnesses seem to be those who are traveling with Jesus. And in John's Gospel, we get the impression that the crowd is made up of a group of people who are already in Jerusalem, and upon hearing of his coming to the city, they go out and they greet him and meet him. Surprisingly, while we refer to the events that occur in this setting as Palm Sunday, and the kids dance around the church with their palms, they wouldn't give us palms when I was a young lad in church because we had sword fights with them, but <laughs> you have well-behaved children as well as a great choir. In fact, in Luke's gospel, there's no mention of there being palms included in the entry. They talk about cloaks, but nothing about palms. It is in Mark and Matthew that we get the idea that the crowd put something down upon his way other than the cloaks mentioned here in Luke. Here we find tree branches mentioned in those Gospels, Matthew and Mark. And it's only in John's Gospel that they read that the crowd cut and laid palm branches down in front of Jesus as he entered the city. And if this were the case, they would have been brought up from Jerusalem, from Jericho, because palm trees don't grow at the altitude of Jerusalem. Bringing these palm branches would have entailed advanced planning. It is somewhat ironic then that a major holiday of the Christian year is named for something that has but one reference to it in the Gospels. Now, I don't want to ruin Palm Sunday for us. <laughs> In the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we find something common to all of these accounts in the Gospels. We notice that this was not a spontaneous entry of Jesus, but something he had planned out well in advance. Jesus had made his preparations for there to be a colt available for his use, and this is not a horse, but rather a young donkey upon which he plans to enter the city. And in understanding this scene, we were reminded in some cases that words fail us. And that visual signs are more powerful than words. There would be no chance to address the crowd. There would be no bank of microphones or a public address system set up for Jesus to make a few remarks as he entered Jerusalem this last week of his life. Indeed, in the coming days, some powerful things would be said by Jesus to his disciples and to others, but he would not be in a position to address the crowd as a whole, so it was that he chose a symbol 
and one that he was sure that those who were watching would understand, that they'd get it. Expectation in Jerusalem at this time was that a Messiah would indeed come, and when he did, the Romans and everyone else had better take notice. The Messiah hoped for would come with power, majesty, and might, and with him would also come a new day. The Romans would be out and God's elect would be in. Happy days would be here again. Chase the clouds of doom away and sing a song of cheer again. Happy days would be here again. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, the crowd cries out in Matthew's gospel, which means save now. And the image would have been of a king riding into battle upon a horse, a sign that God's elect had come to save upon a charger of battle and victory. No horse is seen. Instead, it's upon the back of a young donkey that Jesus enters, and with that entry upon a donkey, he says something very, very powerful, and the crowd surely did not miss it. Now, if a charging horse represents one who comes to do battle, well, then a donkey was a sign of one who comes in peace. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord to bring peace unto us. And I imagine that the scene may well have just been lost upon those who saw it. They saw it, and Jesus wanted them to see it, but did they really take notice? Did they really hear what he was saying to them without uttering a word? Some biblical scholars have said that the triumphal entry in Jerusalem represents the appeal of Jesus that continued beyond this moment of time and space. It is the appeal that he has always made to people. It's the appeal that he makes to us this day to come to him not out of fear or because they believe that he calls them to some temporary victory over the forces of evil that may oppress them. Rather, he was. He was and always represents the appeal of love, the love of a God who ever comes to us and beckons us to come to him. And in our coming to God in Christ, there is the knowledge that in this life we might be called to experience suffering for our faith and belief. For God's way is a way of love, and it is also a way of sacrifice. It reaches out to others, not with a fist of iron, but rather with the appeal that says that things can only change in this world when we're willing to love and to care. There are many responses to this appeal. One's the response of the Pharisees who tell Jesus, silence the crowd. Tell them to be quiet. They're going to stir up trouble. And the last thing we need here in Jerusalem is trouble. And Jesus tells them that they cannot be quiet, for even the stones would cry out if they did not cry out themselves. And in a city where there are so many stones on the streets, in the buildings, huge stones that make up the Temple Mount and the Temple itself, moved by the labor of thousands, (coughs) in Jerusalem there are stones everywhere. And the words of Jesus remind us that the message he speaks, not just with words, but ultimately with his life, cannot be silenced. That day, whether it was just a small group of disciples who watched, or whether it was a whole group of pilgrims who were flocking into the city for the Passover who witnessed this entry of Jesus, There was certainly a whole range of responses to what was being said by Jesus without words. What I want to do for the rest 
this morning's message is talk about some of those responses. One was the response of anger and contempt. Jesus was and always represents a challenge to those who love the way things are. Their response to him is one of contempt and anger. Jesus for them represents a threat to them because he represents a rival to their power and their understanding of things ought to be. It's always been this way, and I guess it always will be this way. Their line is, and besides, we have learned to get along with the Romans. And in our day, these peoples are represented by people who say to themselves and others, we've learned to get along with the political and economic system as it is. We have become accustomed to corruption and special interests and the powers that be. Don't rock the boat. Let things stay the way they are. We like them that way. We like them because we benefit from the present circumstances. There were others in the crowd who did hope for a new day. They took to heart the message of the prophets. They saw the possibilities of a new age and a new day. They were stirred by this Galilee and hoped that things would indeed pan out and he would bring in a new age. To be sure, most of them were focused upon a political kingdom while Jesus was speaking of the kingdom of the heart. In our day, these persons are the reformers, the new agers, the eternal optimist who believes that with the passage of the right law or the election of the right persons, they believe that things can change. And we are blessed by such optimism and often stirred by the hope that they encourage within us. Someone said that in this life that we are either for something or we're against it. Would that be the case? And yet when Jesus came into the holy city so long ago, I suspect that there was another response that in fact was the most prevalent one then and may still be to this very day. It's not the response of adoring belief and hope, nor one of hate and contempt, but rather one of indifference. I am from Pennsylvania, and on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, as you pass near Bedford, Pennsylvania, off to the side of the turnpike, you can see a sign at a church that says this, is it nothing to you who pass by? Well, I'm afraid that then and now the greatest response to Jesus is indifference. Today, as a congregation, we're focused and our eyes are set upon Christ. We're part of the adoring crowd. We sing loud Hosanna. We march around with palms. We are also aware that there are some people in this life who have chosen to oppose Jesus. Some of them will do so in an active manner and we'll know them and my guess is that we'll have no trouble in standing up to them and what they represent. I don't worry about them. What I do worry about is the vast majority of people who seem to slip into the abyss of indifference. For some 45 years, I taught young people who were candidates for confirmation. And I used as part of the curriculum the outline of the Christian faith, which was originally published by the Board of Christian Education of the old Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, not the present one. I'm reminded that the first question of that outline of the Christian faith is, what's the most important thing in life? And the answer given in the outline is to know God, to be God's friend, and to obey God's will. And I would remind my students that the way they would answer that question has much to do with what was going on in their lives.
obviously one of the things going on their, in their lives was that they were preparing to be confirmed, <clears throat> whether it was their will or the will of their parents, they were preparing to be confirmed and to join the church. And I would say that's what is going on for at least young people in the church of that confirmation age. But then I would ask this question. <clears throat> what about tomorrow? And the day after? And when you go away to school or get your driver's license or get a job or get married and buy a house or have a baby or suffer an illness or lose a parent or lose your job and what about when you get ready to retire? What about doing or experiencing a thousand and one things? The tendency can well become to be so involved with the events of daily life that Jesus comes to the city and makes the appeal of love and people are so busy, so preoccupied, so overwhelmed with what they're doing and thinking about that they miss out. And what they do is commit the sin of indifference. Indifference can be a sin because it is not so much something that we do, but rather something that we don't do. It's something that causes us to become separated from God in such a separation hurts us, it hurts others, and ultimately it hurts God. And what Jesus does is he cries out to us about our indifference. Pay attention, he says. Look and listen and wait and abide with me and I'll be with you always. And that's the response that Jesus wants from us. Obviously, his hope is that we'll join him in the cause of faith, in the cause of love that changes the world by changing people. But we'll never get to that point, however, if we let all the things in the events of life clutter our minds and take us away from our focus on being God's friend. Take then the power of this moment, this Palm Sunday 2019, make it as a reference point for what goes on in the world. Make it a reference point from which you go out into the world and into life to live for Christ. Let it be a reminder that on the day that Jesus came to bring peace to his nation, he came to bring you peace and well-being as well. Hold on to that prize. Keep it ever part of you to keep you from cynicism. But more so, hold on to Jesus so that you may live a life not just filled with things and accomplishments, but most of all, filled with the love of God. For that gift of God's love will get you through every valley and over every hard place that you might find yourself in. And it will deliver you with your Lord safe and sound and ever into the glorious presence of God. May God grant you and all of us on this Palm Sunday the precious gift of God's presence and power alive within us now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.